And now, another timely and powerful message from Pastor Emmanuel Williams and Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee. Ah, we have just a few more verses left in Revelation chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Revelation chapter 17. And those of us who, those of you who are joining us on Facebook, YouTube, we thank you so much for joining us. Get your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 17. For the next couple of minutes, let's hear what the save the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. My goal this evening is to attempt to finish the last few verses in Revelation chapter 17. But before, let me give a quick overview of what we've covered thus far. And then we'll address the last few remaining verses. As stated in previous sessions, we all know Revelation chapter 17, the chapter is about a vision given to John by an angel about a woman, a woman riding, riding a beast. In verse 3 of Revelation chapter 17, John tells us what he saw in the vision. He says in Revelation chapter 3, And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. The woman had on her forehead a lot of names, a lot of blasphemous names, and the beast had seven heads and ten horns. That's what he said he saw in the vision. Then in verse 7, if you can jump over to verse 7, in that same vision, the angel told John, I will tell you, that's 7b, the last sentence in verse 7, he said, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The Bible is repeating amen, a certain phrase because it's important. We said last week there is a church and the reason why we take our time to go through the book of Revelation meticulously is because the Bible tells us there is a certain type of church. Jesus said, if you do not straighten up, if you do not become an overcomer, you will go through the great tribulation. And when I say a certain church, I'm not referring to a certain church in a particular locale. I'm referring to there are certain Christians who refuse to live overcomers lifestyle. Who refuse to overcome. Yes, they are Christians. Yes, they are saints. But they refuse. And I shouldn't say refuse, but they haven't matured. Mm -hmm. To live overcoming lives. And so Jesus said, if we fail to do that, he'll allow us not to lose eternity. Mm -hmm. Are you with me, saints? I want you to get that. Not to lose eternity, but be allowed to go through the tribulation. And, the, and God is telling us for those Christians who somewhere, somehow miss the rapture. And that's very unfortunate. When I speak about the church of Thyatira, which is the church God said to, if you do not become an overcomer, you'll go through the great tribulation. Whenever I hear, whenever I discuss it, it saddens me. Because you're going to come, you're going to encounter a man with a beast-like nature. He doesn't look like a beast. The Bible calls him the Antichrist. And he's going to force you to take a sign. Amen. On your forehead, on your right shoulder, you won't be able to buy. Yes, you can get off the greed, but how long can you survive off the greed? Maybe you can on uh, vegetables and fruits. Amen. But why, not, why miss the first flight? Why not just become an overcomer and go with Christ when he returns in the rapture? And so he is, the, the, the Holy Spirit through John is telling us of the type of men. So if you just happen to stay behind, whenever you see this particular individual, which is called the beast, the Bible is describing, you know for sure, you're in the tribulation. Amen. So we've identified the woman as the false religious system of the Antichrist. We all said that. The woman the beast is riding is apostate Christianity. 
a counterfeit of the true Christianity. We said the Antichrist, the beast in the vision is the Antichrist, and he's carrying or supporting this apostate religious system because he needs religion to help him conquer the world. So he's supporting the religious system until he conquers. And we are told that he and the ten kings are going to turn on this apostate religious system and get rid of it. And then he's going to say, worship me now. Because the Antichrist is all about himself. All about greed. The Bible calls him the idol shepherd. The worthless shepherd in Zechariah. Amen? Amen. Now, last week we left off discussing one of the descriptions of the beast recorded in verse 11. Amen. If you can turn to Revelation verse chapter 17, verse 11, I would appreciate that. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 7 read 11, sorry, verse 11 reads, And the beast, the Antichrist, that was... And is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. As I said, I don't have time to go over the descriptions of the Antichrist. But last week we started discussing the descriptions. Amen. This is the one we left off, and I just want to quickly go through it. So both, in both verse 11 and verse 8, we are told something about the Antichrist. We said that he was... And is not, mm -hmm, and yet is, and goeth into perdition. What does that mean? And that's what I want to discuss tonight. When the Bible says the beast was, or the Antichrist was, we said last week, this refers to his original political appearance and rise. Amen. We are told the world is going to be in such turbulence, and as such, will be in search for someone. Uh, uh, to bring stability when the rapture takes place mm -hmm. and the Christians leave the earth there's going to be so much turbulence and the world is going to be looking for a man to bring stability and he will rise to power as one who can solve the problems at that time he will also ratify a peace covenant with the Jews for seven years and will break it after three and a half years. You remember that we said that about him. And so was mean, when the Bible says the beast was in Revelation chapter 17 verse 8 and verse 11, was refers to his rise to political appearance and power. He's going to come under sin because there's going to be a need. When the Bible says that and the beast is not in verse 8, and, and 11, it's referring since to his death by a mortal wound. I don't have time to go through it, but in Daniel, we are told the revived Roman Empire out of that. that do you remember the, the ten toes in the statue? Hmm? God showed Daniel the ten toes, part clay, part iron. That kingdom hasn't come as yet. That's the revived Roman Empire. The beast is seen with seven heads and ten horns. The ten horns is referring to the revived Roman Empire. So in this particular vision, John saw the beast with ten, uh, seven heads and ten horns. In Daniel, Daniel saw a statue with ten toes. Same thing, conveying that in the last days, there's going to come a worldwide empire. Ten confederate states. They're going to come together and they're going to rule the world. Are you with me, saints? And it's taking place. If you read the news, you'll see everything is coming down to fulfill the prophecy in God's word. Amen? So the Bible tells us out of that ten in Daniel, three of them, they're going to wage war against the Antichrist. The, the Antichrist is going to face a lot of opposition. He is not going to rule. People are not going to allow him to rule them. For that matter, the, the, the battle of um, Armageddon, Armageddon is it's going to take place because he presented himself as a problem solver and he cannot solve any problems and so the the kings of the east they're going to come down and fight him to take over are you getting what I'm saying saints so the bible says when the bible says the beast is not it's referring to his death by a mortal wound three of the ten kings 
uh, our ten nations are going to fight him and he's going to suffer a wound, a mortal wound. Some people think he's going to die. Some people think it's a, some commentators think it's a counterfeit, a staged death. Whichever it is, we'll know. Amen. When it does happen, Zechariah chapter 11 verse 17 and in Revelation 13, don't turn there. Three tells us about the mortal wound. Amen. So the phrase is not, that phrase is not right here in Revelation 17 11. It's been translated non existence. There is not without except. We said last week the phrase was first mentioned in the Bible by whom? Anybody remembered? Who was the first person who mentioned the phrase is not? Jacob. Jacob was the first one who used the word is not joseph he said joseph is not and simeon is not because he thought they were dead so when the bible says here that the beast is not it would seem to convey that the beast somewhere somehow died because of a mortal wound amen praise the lord <sighs> glory be to jesus so the beast that thou sowest was his rise to, polit to political power and is not his death as a result of a mortal wound according to Zechariah. Can you go to Zechariah? Let's just look at the text. Zechariah chapter 11 verse 17. That's the text used to support that he's going to suffer. Zechariah 11 17 and then we'll go to Revelation 13 3. Both of the text tells us that he's going to suffer a mortal wound. You got it? It says, Woe to the idle shepherd that liveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. He's going to suffer hmm? an accident of some sort. And his arm is going to shrivel. And his right eye, he might lose his right eye. His arm shall be cling dried up. And his right eye shall be utterly, utterly darkened. The idol shepherd, referring to the Antichrist. Uh, by the way, the word idol here suggests a person who is harsh and a hardened fool. Someone who is harsh and just not open to anybody's opinion, advice, not open to anybody's contribution because of his pride this shepherd will have no concern for the flock and its needs he will be interested only in his own greed so instead of defending the flock the foolish shepherd will destroy it amen as i said idol shepherd here means foolish or worthless shepherd and the antichrist is the ultimate fulfillment of the worthless or foolish shepherd I, I i always say if you happen to miss the rapture and you're here and you see a guy ruling the world with looking like a pirate <laughs> and one arm is shriveled <laughs> this is the antichrist the Bible has given us enough information for us to identify who he is. <laughs> we are also told that the beast yet is. Yet is. So he was. He's not. He's yet is. Can you go back to verse 8 please? Or verse 11. Oh it's right here. Yet is. Revelation chapter 17 verse 11. 8. You got it right here. Let's go to 8. 8 and 11 has the same information. The last part of verse 8, you see the last phrase here? And is not, and yet is. So he was, he rose to political power and influence and affluence. He was not, he got into a fight and died or he staged his death. And yet is. Yet is, is referring to his return, his recovery. His supposedly miraculous recovery from his mortal wound i notice what i said supposed miraculous recovery from his mortal wound revelation chapter 13 let's see what revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 has to say quickly i'm taking my time to go through these the next time around we'll be flying through 
<laughs> Amen. Hopefully you'll have the foundation laid already. You got it? Revelation chapter 13, 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. After he, of course they would worship him and wonder after him. Because he appears to be dead and suddenly, miraculously he recovered. And so people are saying, he's the one. He's the savior of the world. Let me say, he's not. <laughs> he staged his death. He's a counterfeit. He's looking to bring as many people to hell with him. That's all he cares. He's an idle shepherd. He's a worthless and a foolish shepherd. Do not follow him. Do not follow him. Oh God, we give you praise. So people will think that he has he died and then made a sudden appearance. And as I said, I believe it's a counterfeit resurrection. Since the devil, all he does is counterfeit. He, has a, he counterfeits everything. He copies everything from God. He's a master counterfeit. Everything God has, he copies. Amen? And what he's looking for is worship. Amen? That's all he wants. Worship. Now, before I go further, before I go further, brothers and sisters, there is a phrase in Revelation chapter 17 verse 8 that I want to address. I scoured the scripture and scoured commentators trying to get some information on this statement because a lot of commentators just pass over it and it's, it's out there, people are asking questions about it. And there's a lot of conjecture out there. So I want to bring some type of resolution to that statement. And the statement in here is, And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. It is right here in verse 8. Let's read verse 8 from the top. And we'll, when we come to that phrase, We'll spend some time on it. The beast that thou sowest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is the abyss. It's the jailhouse for demons. Okay. He's going to go down in the bottomless pit. Amen. That, uh, 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 he's going to come out. It's a demon that's coming from the bottomless pit to possess the Antichrist. Are you with me? And go into perdition. Perdition here means eternal destruction. This man is destined to be doomed. That's why we said do not follow him. And here it comes. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. He's now demon possessed. He made a recovery. We thought he was dead. And what he's doing, as I said, he's counterfeiting what happened to God's two witnesses. Remember God's two witnesses. Some think it's Moses and Elijah. Some thinks it's Enoch and Elijah. Amen. It's one of the three. It's two of the three. They died on the earth for three days and then resurrected went to heaven. He's going to stage the very same. He's a counterfeit. He doesn't have anything original. That's why throughout the book of Revelation, there is a phrase you cannot miss. He that have ears, let him what? Yeah, and he doesn't mean male. He means the individual who has ears to hear, let him or her hear. Because many of us, we have ears, but we don't hear. We don't have time to discuss that. But So right here, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, and here it comes, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. I've been looking and scouring, scouring through commentaries to see who can, because this is how there. Some people are convinced that God has reserved the select few to be used as fuel for hellfire. Let me say it again. Some people are convinced that God, because of this phrase, God has reserved a select few to be used as fuel for hellfire. 
The Bible says there are some people whose name were not written in the book of life. What is the book of life? The, it's called, the book of life is sometimes called, sometimes called the Lamb's book of life. And it is where all the names of true believers in Jesus are recorded. The book of life contains the names of each person who is eternally elect. Can somebody say thank you Jesus? So your name is there, my name is there, everybody who has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, their names are there. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 states, Revelation 20 15 states, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Can somebody say thank you that my name is in the book of life? Thank you Lord that my name is in the, written in the book of life. The Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. I am not going to be cast. Amen. Praise the Lord. In eternal darkness. So if your name is in that book, you avoid the great, the great white throne. Judgment. There is the judgment seat of Christ where Christians will appear after the rapture for rewards. And there is the great white throne judgment where unbelievers will appear for punishment. Mm, are you with me, saints? If your name is in the book of is in the Lamb's book of life, thank God you you you'll be appearing before Jesus, but for your reward. Since that is why it's so important the way we live on this earth. This is a rehearsal for the millennial reign. Let me say that again. The lives we live on this earth now is a rehearsal for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Not now, not everybody wants to rule in the millennial reign. Not every Christian wants to rule. Hmm? Is that the truth or the truth? Well, maybe, you, maybe you, you might be saying, no, but I know some Christian who said to me, I just want to get there. That's all. And I know some Christians who, who said, not only do I want to get there, I want to reign and rule with Jesus Christ. Because this earth is a type of hell. It shouldn't be, but sometimes the pressures of this life, sometimes the devil coming against you. That is why, brothers and sisters, we Christians should always be striving to become overcomers. Are you getting what I'm saying? You and I should always be striving to become overcomers. You say, what do you mean? Look at the way Jesus lived. We have the greatest model of who an overcomer is, and that is Jesus Christ in the Bible. Look at his life. Amen. Let me move on here. Let me move on. Glory be to Jesus. How many of you want to reign and rule with Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. Governors. and There will be governors. There will be mayors. There will be senators. There will be what else? Prime ministers. Whatever we have on the earth now. They'll be there, legislators, they'll be magistrates and judges. Are you with me, saints? But those of us who are going to do it, we'll have what is called a glorified body. Amen, a glorified body. Oh, that's good, that's good news. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I cannot risk not ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. That's why we get saved. And the problem is that part of Christianity is never stressed. You know, we get people saved and we throw them. And then we go get people saved and we save and, and not get them equipped to be reign, to reign and rule. That, so that aspect of Christianity is never emphasized. It is so important to know why we live here. We are not just living here. We were brought in the kingdom of God to become overcomers. Amen. Every Christian should be striving to become an overcomer. Well, or not. <laughs> I'm just joking. But I need to deliver that question here. Of this particular phrase. Because there is a lot of conjecture out there about this phrase. Amen. If one were to look at this phrase without researching this area thoroughly, then one will conclude just from this phrase that God did did not write people's names some people's names in the book of life from the foundation of the earth how many of you agree if you just read this right here 
and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. You see that and you say, oh my God, it would seem that some people's names were not written. And that's what's happening now because people are looking at that verse without doing the necessary research. But if you understand who God is, if you read this right here, this should bother you. This should really bother you and not only bother you, it should be the impetus for you to do some research. It should serve as a reason. It should motivate you to do some research. God, are you saying? How many of you know some people who died out of Christ? I did. I do. So, so do you mean that? So are you telling me God created these people just to go to hell? But that's not what's communicated, unfortunately. Amen? Uh, this is one of the doctrines embraced by those who subscribe to John Calvin's teaching. John Calvin, John, those who subscribe to John Calvin's teaching are called Calvinists. They are not called Christians. I understand why now. They are called whom? Calvinists. And they embrace that doctrine. Since if God purposefully did not write some people's name in the book of life from the foundation of the earth, but reserve these people for fuel to be used as hell, then he's practiced favoritism. It's called respect of persons in Romans 2.11. Romans 2.11 says there is no respect of persons with God. God does not practice partiality. Amen. So if God did that, his practice speciality, that's why, no wonder there is very little, info, very, little info, very little information on this right here. Looking all over the Bible for it. Reading commentators, they pass it straight. Second Peter 3, 9 says what? God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Amen. But is what? Long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who should come to repentance? All should come to repentance. Not some. That is why there is no way God can purposefully elect not to write certain people's name. In the Lamb's book of life from the foundations of the earth. That is what I call cruelty. And God is not a cruel God. Hmm? Oh, glory be to Jesus. Why give people a choice and then decide their eternal destination before they were born? Why do that? So, let me share with you a verse. That will help reconcile both accounts and hopefully clarify this erroneous teaching. Are you ready for that verse? Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. You got it? Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord. The individual that overcometh. Didn't I say Jesus is looking for whom? Overcomers. The individuals who overcome the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And here it comes. And I will not blot out his or her name out of what? The book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Jesus is saying, if you're an overcomer, I will not what? Blot out your name. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you. To blot out somebody's name. It was already, that's my point. So when everybody born, God gave everybody a chance. Everybody's name was written in the book of life. Because God is giving everybody a chance. However, because of our choices, thank you so much. God has to, yes, he's heartbroken, but because of your choice, God is not going to force you to go to heaven if you don't want to go to heaven. He's not going to force you to live right if you don't want to live right. So because you choose not to accept the cure for sin, which is Jesus Christ. You chose to 
carry your own sin. Take your own sin upon your own self. Because you chose to do that, then you will be rewarded accordingly. God has to blot your name out. Now that's very sad. That's very sad. And that is the scripture that is going to help us reconcile this erroneous teaching. That God elects some from eternity to go to heaven and God doesn't. We take questions after. Glory be to Jesus. Write it down. Don't forget it. Okay? Praise the Lord. So since, let me just say one more time. God is not purposefully reserving people to be used as fuel for hellfire. I'm not sure why people still think that God is mad with human beings. Let me share this with you, sins. God is not mad at humans anymore. I know some of you are saying, oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm going to show you on the, th on the authority of God's word that God is not mad with human beings anymore. Old Testament, Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's Old Testament. Can somebody say that's Old Covenant? Well, Hebrews 8.6 says we have a better covenant. A what? A better covenant. And I'm going to show you what the better covenant says. Mm, glory be to Jesus. A better covenant based on better promises. Hebrews said I love it. It says we have obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more also we have a better a mediator of a better covenant. Which was established on better promises. Or a covenant. God is angry with the sinners every day. New covenant. God does not impute sin. Well, let me move on here. Let me move on here and I'll tell you. Uh, this prophet, prophet Isaiah recorded for us in chapter 53 what Jesus accomplished at the cross and how God felt about it. Can we just visit it? For those of you who are looking, let me say that again. God is no longer mad with humans. One commentator, Andrew, he said, God is not even in a bad mood. He's just chilling. Ah, bless the Lord. He's just chilling. It says here in Isaiah chapter 53, God gave prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5, God gave prophet Isaiah a vision as to what the cross was what Jesus did at the cross, what he was going to accomplish and how God felt about it. I know it's long, but I got to read it because some people, it hasn't moved from our head to our hearts. Amen. So sometimes we got to read it all so it can move from our head to our hearts. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. But he was what? Wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, chastisement here means punishment of our peace, of our what? of our peace the punishment for our nothing missing nothing lacking nothing broken mm, was upon him and by his stripes we are what healed it continues it gets better all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord hath laid on jesus christ the iniquity of us on whom the lord laid it all of it on Jesus Christ. Verse 7. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Yet he opened out his mouth. He didn't say a thing when they accused him. He didn't say a thing when they brought him before Pilate. Amen. Glory be. Can you thank God for Jesus? Hallelujah. And he was going through it not for him. But for us. He was brought as a lamb to be slaughtered. And as a sheep before her, her sharers is dumb. So he opened out his mouth. Verse 8. I like verse 8. He was taken from prison. And from judgment. Meaning prison here means it was a conspiracy. And judgment is perversion of justice. There is a lot of that going on today. Conspiracy and perversion of justice. But Jesus is coming to take over. One day. And all that perversion of justice and conspiracy and the who's who will all disappear when the king of kings and the lord of lords plant his foot on this earth. Oh glory be to God. Hallelujah. 
Oh, bless God. It continues here. And who shall, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. He didn't have a time to get married, have a family, make some money. They just took him out. For the transgression of my people was his stricken. I'm reading it, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth since he was not doing that because he was guilty verse 10 is a verse we need to be concerned about verse 10 says yet it pleased the lord that's why i said god is no longer in a bad mood god is not mad with anybody anymore because it pleased the lord to what Bruise him. Bruise means bruise meant to beat down to pieces. It pleased God to crush him, to beat him down. He hath put him to grief. God put Jesus to grief and sorrow. Oh God, I give thee praise. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. God made Jesus his soul an offering for seed, sin because he saw us. He saw us coming to Christ. Oh, glory be to God. Oh, God, I thank you. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Right here it comes again. Verse 11 says, He, God, shall see the travail of his soul. God shall see the travail, travail here means the toil, the wearisome, the mischief that was done to Jesus. And he shall be what? Satisfied. God, I give you praise. God is not mad anymore because he crushed Jesus instead of us. That is why he's not reserving anybody to be used as fuel for hell. That is why he didn't uh, God, I give you praise. Let me move on here. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It says here, and he shall, and he shall be satisfied. Satisfied here means fully pleased. Suffice. God said, that's enough. I'm all right. By his knowledge shall my righteous servants justify many. By his knowledge. Jesus had knowledge of what he was doing would accomplish. <laughs> oh glory. Jesus knew that what he was doing would make a way for me and make a way for you make a way for the world because the devil had us in the grip of his hands oh glory be to Jesus but Jesus died and pry opened his fingers and said let them go let my people go oh glory be to Jesus Hallelujah. Mm. Glory be to Jesus. For there, the last part of the verse says, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear what? Their iniquities. So Jesus has borne our iniquities. There is no need for God to be mad with me. Mm hmm. Can somebody say, God is not even in a bad mood? God is not even in a bad mood. Let, let me say it slower. God is not even in a bad mood. He's not mad with you. He's not mad with me. Because he took our sins. Our iniquities were laid upon Jesus Christ. The punishment for all the sins of humanity committed in the past. The punishment for all the sins of humanity that are currently being committed. The punishment for all the sins of humanity in the future was what? Was born, laid upon Jesus on the cross. And how did God feel about it? It pleased the Lord. <laughs> he was satisfied. God said, I'm all right now. Somebody paid the price. Oh, glory be to Jesus. I'm no longer mad with human beings. Glory be to God. God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. 
We bless your name. That's Isaiah chapter 53. Now this is what, listen now, Isaiah 54 presents the benefits derived from what Jesus accomplished in Isaiah 53. Do you want to hear what Isaiah 54 says? Let's go quickly. We won't read all because we don't have time. Verse 1, Isaiah 54. 1 reads, Sing, O barren, thou that, oh my God, sing back. <coughs> barren people don't sing. But because of what Jesus did, we are no longer barren, no longer helpless. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you. No longer unfit for use. No longer cannot provide. No longer. We thank you, Lord. Sing, O barren, thou that this did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that did not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married, saith the Lord. Here it comes, verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitation. Spear not. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you shall break forth on the right. Break forth on the left hands. Break forth all around. Hallelujah. Tell somebody I'm breaking forth. I'm breaking forth. I'm, bre say, I'm breaking forth. I'm breaking forth. I'm breaking forth. Yeah, I'm breaking forth on the right. I'm breaking forth on the left. Hallelujah. And your seed shall inherit <laughs> the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm breaking out. 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 I'm breaking out of that prison. I'm breaking out. I'm breaking out of that stronghold. I'm breaking out. Tonight, I'm breaking out. Lord, we thank you and we bless your name. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Let's jump over to verse 5 quickly. Verse 5. Verse 5 says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Your maker is your husband. You shall break forth. Woo! We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Verse 9. I want to read verse 9 and verse 10 and then we'll call it quits for tonight. Is that all right? You got to read verse 9. Verse 9 says, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should not, should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be what? Wrath with you. Wrath means what? Upset, mad. God said, I'm not mad with you. I'm not angry with you. And I'm not going to rebuke you. It's right here. Because of Isaiah 53. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. God said, I will never be wrath, mad with you. Nor rebuke you. And here it comes. For the mountains shall depart <laughs> and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on you. Oh, can somebody give the Lord some praise? Can somebody give the Lord some praise? And since that's why when the, you remember when the angel, and I'm done, that's my fourth time saying done, but promise this is the last time. Sometimes it gets so good, you can't let it go. It's difficult to let go sometimes. Amen. That is why when the angels greeted the shepherds to announce the birth of Jesus, they exclaimed in Luke chapter 2, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. We shall be to all people. Verse 14 is the verse I like. He says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. The covenant of peace. Kebo Saraba. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards human beings. Isn't that a blessing? David had a pick. God gave David revelation of the cross, of what the cross would accomplish. And in Psalms 32, 
Verse 1, David said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. The Holy Spirit said the very same thing through Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 6 to it. I'll read it and I'll done. I'll be done. It says in Romans chapter 4 verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the human being to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Can you give the Lord a praise? Please take time to meditate on the Word and let it sink into your heart and soul and mind today. Knowing that the Christian who meditates on the Word will be like a tree planted by the water, bringing forth fruit in its season and prospering in all that he does. But what if you aren't a Christian today? What if you don't know if you're bound for heaven as a forgiven child of God? If that's you, then let's take care of it right now if you're ready. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins and washed clean and made new? Are you ready to begin your new life in Christ? Then turn to God right now and say, Lord, I love you. I need you. I repent of my sins. Lord, please forgive me and wash me clean. I receive your forgiveness right now as I put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. God, please lead me and teach me and show me how to live from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you're looking for a good church family, you'll be welcomed with open arms at Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee, located at 4750 Capital Circle Southeast near Tram Road. Sunday school begins for all ages at 10 a.m. and the morning service begins at 11. And the Wednesday evening service begins at 7. This is a life-giving, multicultural, multi-generational church where people of all races, backgrounds, and walks of life come together to worship, to be inspired in their love for God, to develop relationships, and to be empowered to live out God's purpose for their lives. Find more information on their website, imitatorsofgodministries.com, or call the church, 850-408-8496.